function of the coin flip. Okay, gentlemen, I think we're, we're, we're good to go. Yep. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Hillsborough County Democratic Committee's uh, gubernatorial forum. Uh, we're delighted to have as our moderator tonight, uh, Dean Spiliotis. Uh, Dean is a civic scholar in the School of Arts and Sciences at S S Southern New Hampshire University. He's also founder of the political blog, nhpoliticalcapital.com. Uh, Dean teach, Dean's teaching focuses uh, on presidential politics and policy campaigns and elections and New Hampshire politics and its presidential primary. Um, you didn't tune in to listen to me, so I'm gonna hand things over to Dean who will explain the, the rules for tonight's uh, presentation. Take it away, Dean. Mm -hmm. Uh, thanks, Roger. Uh, my thanks to the Hillsborough County Democratic Committee uh, and to both campaigns for inviting me to moderate the debate. Uh, my hope is that we'll have a, an informative and enjoyable conversation uh, about some very important issues that are facing uh, Granite State voters in advance of the Democratic primary uh, next month. Uh, let me say a word about format for the event. Um, each candidate will have three minutes for an opening statement. The order was determined in advance with uh, Andrew Walensky uh, going first. Um, and then there will also be a three minute uh, closing statement at the end as well. Um, each candidate will have 90 seconds to respond uh, to questions from the moderator. Um, I'll have an additional 30 seconds uh, to be used for follow ups or rebuttals at my discretion. Um, and we'll make sure that any additional time given to the candidates is distributed evenly uh, across both individuals uh, over the duration of the entire debate so that nobody gets a time advantage. Uh, Committee Chair Roger Lassard has uh, uh, agreed to serve as our dedicated timekeeper. Uh, we have some professional uh, cards at the ready. Uh, so I ask the candidates to please be aware uh, of the time. Uh, so let's meet the candidates and get started with the opening statements. Uh, up first is going to be Executive Counselor Andrew Valinsky, followed by State Senate Majority Leader Dan Feltes. So, Andrew, uh, Counselor, the floor is yours for three minutes. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Hillsborough County, for hosting us tonight. I am so excited. We were endorsed yesterday after a long democratic process by the State Employees Union, 8,500 members. About a week <laughs> earlier, the 17,000 members of NEA New Hampshire endorsed us. Look, we're in the midst of a crisis. It's COVID, it's economic, it's healthcare, it's climate change, it's racial injustice. Now is the time for bold ideas and courageous leadership. Now is also the time to break the ties of the failed Republican jargon that has limited debates and discussions for so long. So look, everyone, I think will know that I was the Claremont School funding lawyer. Uh, we convinced the Supreme Court for the first time in our state's history to recognize a constitutional right to a state funded education. That was a bold idea, but for lack of courageous leadership, we never fulfilled the promise of Claremont. When I first went to Claremont, uh, it was a lot like going home for me. I grew up in a mill town where the mill failed. My dad was a maintenance man and a mechanic and a union shop steward. My mother was a homemaker. I'm the only one in my family to go to college. I paid for law school by working as a carpenter. I understand the importance of educational opportunity. In many instances, it's a question of economic justice. In some instances, in places like Manchester and Nashua, it's a question of racial justice. Our two lowest spending school districts in the state are also the most diverse districts. My experience growing up, my experience in Claremont has led me to the conclusion that I will never take the pledge. We have to have the adult discussion about how we, we fund important services like education in our state. The other issue we need to talk about is climate change. I happen to be a grandfather. My younger grandson is just 13 weeks old and uh, I've never held him. I've concluded that the time for half measures is gone. I worry about the future we're leaving the, our children and our children's children. That's why I was so opposed 
to the Granite Bridge fracked gas pipeline. It was a $400 million 20 year commitment in the exact wrong direction. We didn't need it to help working class people heat their homes. There are better alternatives. We need to focus on moving forward on the environment and we need to take Chris Sununu out of office. Go to valinskynh.com to learn more and to join us. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Valinsky. Uh, Senator Feltis, the floor is yours for three minutes. Thank you very much, Dean and Roger and Sabrina <coughs> and Katie and, and Andrew for joining. Look, uh, as the majority leader of the state Senate, I can tell you without any hesitation or equivocation, the singular obstacle to meaningful and inclusive progress for all our families, all our communities and the state of New Hampshire is Chris Sununu. And with your help, we're gonna beat Chris Sununu this fall. We're gonna do that, working together. We've got to. Uh, look, I live in the south end of Concord on Hope Avenue with my wonderful wife, Erin. Our two amazing daughters, Iris and Josie. Our two dogs, Franklin and Roosevelt. And I have a distinctly different perspective than the current governor. You see, my dad wasn't governor. My brother wasn't US senator and I was never gifted a ski resort. My dad worked in a furniture factory for 45 years, the same furniture factory doing roughly the same job day in and day out in an on air conditioned furniture factory for 45 years. My mom, part time jobs, including the night shifts while raising four kids. The gifts they gave me were the values of hard work, honesty, and integrity, and looking out for everybody, especially working people and working families, so often left out, left behind. Those are the values I've tried to live my entire life. Right out of law school, not joining a job as a corporate uh, attorney at a corporate firm working in legal aid for about 10 years, representing low to middle income families and seniors and veterans, helping people during the last economic crisis, the great recession, get back up on their feet, seeing so many of the same people fall through the cracks now that fell through the cracks then. That's what this race is about, making sure that working people, working families have someone in their corner, in the corner office. In the state Senate led the charge for six years and as majority leader on so many of our values and issues, bumping up against Chris Sununu almost every step of the way though, 79 vetoes, record setting vetoes, 65 of which had bipartisan support. It's no wonder Sununu calls himself, in his words, a Trump guy through and through. And you've seen it, especially of late, vetoing health insurance coverage for abortion health care services, not doing a school reopening plan of any sort, no public health standards, no support for our schools. I'm the only candidate for governor, including the current governor, who put out a school reopening plan because that's leadership we need to step up right now for working people and working families. We gotta win this race. There's so much at stake. And we gotta work hard to lift one another up, not tear people down. In order to move New Hampshire forward, we can't afford to leave anyone behind. We're gonna work to include more people in our democracy and economy, not to exclude them, and work for a relief and recovery effort that works for everybody, not just those at the top, not just folks that might have Chris Sununu's cell phone number. Everybody matters, everybody counts in our democracy. So I look forward to the debate and discussion tonight. I respectfully ask for your vote, but more than that, I respectfully ask for your ongoing activism. Hillsborough County Democrats, we need you. We need you. We need you to win this race. And I'm confident that working together, we're not just gonna win up and down the ballot. We're gonna finally move New Hampshire forward for everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Feltis. Okay, let's turn to some uh, Q and A now. Uh, and let's start with the pandemic. Uh, New Hampshire has fared relatively well in comparison to the rest of the country. Um, while our over 400 deaths in our state is a genuine human tragedy, the positivity rate for infections is quite low and large swaths of the state have few or no active cases. Uh, governors, we've seen governors in other states uh, be punished in their public approval for a failure to effectively confront the virus. Uh, but Governor Sununu continues to receive relatively high public approval from Granite Staters. So my question to both of you, and I'm going to start with uh, Councillor Malinsky, my question to both of you is, what should the governor be doing differently uh, and why? You have 90 seconds to start. So let's start with resetting the premise of your question. Uh, it's not fair to compare New Hampshire to New York and Georgia. Compare us to the other northern New England states, and you'll find that we have twice the infection rate as Vermont and almost twice of, of Maine. We have seven times the death rate of Vermont 
and three times the death rate of Maine. And so we, we need to hold Sununu to account for that. So in the beginning of April, uh, I confronted Sununu and asked him to issue a mask order for people in public indoor spaces and in outdoor gatherings. Sununu told me he'd just been talking to Mike Pence and there was no public health data that supported the effectiveness of masks. That simply is not true. We should have issued one then. We should have issued one ever since then. So that's a basic difference, but really the best place to look at Sununu's failure to offer leadership is with school opening. My plan has lower density, outdoor education, protecting teachers and other school workers on workers' comp benefits. All of that is in our detailed plan. It's too bad that Sununu, working with Edelblue, took the Betsy DeVos approach to school reopening, and they've made a complete hash out of it. Uh, Senator Feltis, same question to you. Uh, what should the governor be doing differently and why? Uh, 90 seconds. Uh, thanks. I mean, I, look, I, I think it is appropriate for the governor to, to, to do press conferences during a time of pandemic. And the notion that he's better at press conferences than Donald Trump, which is the case, and that's a pretty low bar, <laughs> is, is driving some of this uh, activity right now. But let's be honest about the facts on the ground. Economically, people are hurting. Working families, people on the ground are hurting. We got 15% unemployment, highest in New England. Uh, we got a governor who vetoed housing inspections. People are losing their homes right now, renters and homeowners. Bill I sponsored to protect homeowners and renters. Same people I looked out for when Wall Street banks were foreclosing on people all across New Hampshire during the Great Recession. Those same people are losing their homes right now because of Chris Sununu and his vetoes. Paid family medical leave insurance, a bill I led on, that he not only vetoed, he auctioned <laughs> off a copy of his veto to partisan political fundraiser uh, to the highest bidder. And the US flag and New Hampshire flag flown over the state house who day vetoed paid family leave. All of these things, PPE for small businesses, vetoed. Nursing home support, vetoed. No school reopening plan. And you know, it's one thing uh, to draft an op-ed on school reopening, it's another thing to put forward a plan. That's what we did. 19 page plan, uh, live free and learn safe. Uh, teachers spend about 423 bucks out of pocket each year uh, just to do their own job. We provide n masks to teachers and we provide a whole host of mechanism, HVAC, masks. Uh, we need to do that. We need to move forward on that. Honored to have the support of the American Federation of Teachers representing teachers in Nashua in this race. Um, I want to stay on the pandemic a little bit longer. You both mentioned a couple of important topics within the broader topic of uh, the pandemic, uh, masks uh, and education. Let's start with masks. Uh, and this will be 90 seconds each. And I'm going to start with you, Senator Feltis, this time. Uh, the governor has now mandated masks uh, for events, scheduled events with over 100 uh, people that are trying to enforce mass rules uh, being assaulted, uh, being harassed at a minimum. How do you enforce something like this? And I'm thinking particularly in the context of something like Motorcycle Week. Should Motorcycle Week be canceled, for example? Um, and more generally, how do you enforce uh, uh, mask regulations, particularly uh, in these kinds of large uh, events? And again, Senator Feltis, we'll start with you for 90 seconds. Thank you very much, Dean. So. We're the only state, just sort of a baseline here, we're the only state in New England without any public mask requirement of any sort. And uh, long called for a common sense public mask requirement. It's one thing if you're out walking your dog by yourself. It's another thing if you're in groups or places of public accommodations, including grocery stores. That affects our frontline workers. That affects all of us. So there should be a common sense public mask requirement. Uh, Maine and Vermont, uh, take a look at it in terms of the enforcement differently. Um, the reality is, is some minimal enforcement is necessary. Uh, and just like the same argument came up, Dean, on the stay at home orders, like people said, well, you can't enforce it, that kind of thing. Well, the overarching benefit is actually issuing the order and telling people this is what you should do. Um, that's the real benefit. Um, you know, setting aside criminal penalties and that kind of stuff, the benefit is saying this is what you should be doing. And we know based on the science and data and public health data, that's what should be happening. 
We also know that in schools, it matters a lot. That's why in Live Free and Learn Safe, a actual school reopening plan that we put forward, uh, we provide five reusable cloth face covering for every student in the state. That's something North Carolina did. North Carolina could do it, we can do it. Uh, so we gotta look out, these are basic things. And that's what I'm saying. Sanuti's shown his true colors recently. He's punted all school decisions down to the local level. No wonder he calls himself the Trump guy through and through. Mm -hmm. uh, Senator Feltes, I want to I want to follow up with you for 30 seconds to press you a little bit harder on an event like Motorcycle Week. What would enforcement of that mask mandate look like under a Feltes administration? Would it be police? Would it be vendors? Uh, who would be responsible for enforcing something when we're looking at tens of thousands of people attending? 30 seconds, please. Well, thank you. And, and this is critical for our businesses too, because businesses don't want to have to selectively tell people when they come into their establishment, you got to put a mask on. That's why there needs to be a standard. And some of this is peer pressure. Some of it's business owners saying no mask, no service. Some of it's people on the ground uh, enforcing it. Um, but, you know, look, if you look at Maine and Vermont, I think they have some pretty modest enforcement mechanisms, but they certainly uh, have enforcement in there. And I think that's important. Okay. Uh, 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 Councilor Valinsky, same question. Uh, how, how do you enforce a mask mandate? Well, first, you need to know its implications. Uh, we need 80% compliance with the mask mandate under public health data that's pretty widely available. So if you get four out of five people to comply, you're going to shut down the virus. And that happens mostly from just the issuance of the order. People who worry about protecting their community members, their neighbors, their friends, their relatives will comply if we're clear in what we request of them, number one. And number two, if we model the behavior that we want. So Dan and I were just at one of our uh, few in-person events, everyone was wearing a mask. When we spoke, when we took questions, we wore masks. That's how you model good behavior. You set the example yourself. As to how you enforce, there have been different approaches. I'm less concerned with focusing on how you enforce because that's the excuse that Sununu and Trump and others are using to fail to issue the mandate in the first place. Let's issue the mandate. People of good conscience worried about their neighbor's safety will comply. Uh, you also have mentioned in your, in your initial answers in discussing the pandemic, the issue of education. Um, and the Governor Sununu and the State Department of, uh, of uh, Education uh, under Mr. Edelblut has been uh, criticized for not providing sufficiently uniform guidance on school opening. Um, but let me be devil, devil's advocate here. Uh, with different parts of the state experiencing very different rates of infection and activity, let's say Littleton and Berlin versus Manchester and Nashua, uh, why shouldn't the decision be left to local school, dis uh, school districts? Uh, and Councilor Valinsky, we'll start with you this time. Yeah, there are 488 school buildings in New Hampshire. We don't have a clue as to the air handling capacity in each of those school buildings. And we know what the engineering standard is. The air should turn two and a half times an hour in any classroom, any indoor space that you want to use. That's a standard. It was incumbent on Sununu and Edel Blue to set forward the standard. We shouldn't put, regardless of the rate of infection, teachers, children, other school personnel in classrooms unless they can meet the standard. Now, you're right. Schools act as part of a community. Some communities, particularly up north, some communities out towards Sullivan County to the west, are less impacted by COVID-19. There are fewer positive cases. And they enjoy, should enjoy, a little bit more latitude. But you still have to meet the standards of air quality. You still have to meet the goal of lowering density in classrooms by staggering attendance, staggering use of buses, you should be teaching outside as much as you possibly can. And there is no excuse for the governor not adopting by an emergency order a workers' comp presumption that says any school personnel who gets sick with COVID got it at school and are entitled to workers' comp.
Senator Felkus, same question, 90 seconds. Thanks, Dean. I think this is being cast by some as an issue of state versus local control. That's not what it is. Um, this is a matter of just doing your job. Public health is the job of the governor. Uh, he refused to do his job. He abdicated his responsibility, punted to the local level, just like Trump punted everything on schools down, uh, did the same thing. And it's not like the virus changes, Dean, if it's in Manchester versus if it's in Berlin. It's a public health issue. And so issuing clear public health guidance and, and standards and providing financial support to our schools is what should have happened. That's what we laid out in our plan, Live Free and Learn Safe. We worked with former commissioner of HHS, Ned Helms, among other public health professionals <laughs> to develop it. That's what needs to happen. The hard work that goes into actually creating a plan. Um, and so we put it out there. And that's what should happen right now. And you know, you got people in Manchester, Nashville, and across the state making tough decisions on the ground. Folks who run for school board do it in good faith out of a sense of public service. They're not epidemiologists. They're, they're signing up to help their communities. And uh, Sununu let them high and dry without any guidance and any financial support with five weeks to go. Uh, you know, there should be at least 100 million of CARES Act money given to our communities and our school boards right now so they can uh, update their infrastructure, do the plexiglass, help with paid sick days for our teachers and faculty and help deal with the busing system among many other problems that people are facing on the ground right now. Uh, one more question on the pandemic uh, and then we'll move on, but let's talk about the economic side of the pandemic. Uh, and let me ask you both about the pace of the reopening of New Hampshire's uh, economy, its businesses, restaurants, retail, tourism, et cetera. Uh, is the current pace about right? Uh, or would you time it differently uh, based on conditions? Um, and under what conditions, if any, would you consider, uh, if you would, uh, issuing uh, another stay-at-home order similar to what Governor Sununu issued uh, at the end of March? Uh, and this time we'll start with Senator Feltis. Well, thanks, Dean. To the latter question, you just listen, you have to listen to the public health experts. Um, you know, and the truth is Governor Sununu was one of the last uh, to, uh, especially in New England, to issue stay at home and the first to reopen. Um, and simple steps right now, like a common sense public mask requirement, which our businesses are calling for because they don't want to be the ones that tell people, hey, no mask in my business and then lose business. Um, so it makes sense, not just as a public health matter, it makes sense as an economic matter. It also makes sense in terms of worker safety. And we, we had legislation to provide free PPE to small businesses. It was vetoed by Chris Sununu. We have legislation to do worker safety, uh, laid out a workers COVID-19 bill of rights because worker safety is public safety. And uh, all of that stuff that we worked on was vetoed uh, by Chris Sununu. So economically, he's making the wrong decisions. He's, he's making decisions that are creating a false choice between public health and economics. And you know what, when we look out for workers and we provide protections, we can get this economy humming again. We got, got to look out for workers. And that's what this is about, Dean. And Chris Sununu actually wrote a letter to the federal delegation arguing for corporate immunity for corporations who put their workers at risk in COVID-19. So when I say this is about what side are you on, are you on workers and workers' family sides in this election or corporations and corporate special interests? That's what I mean. And that's what's at stake in this election. Uh, Councillor Walensky, same question, the uh, pace of New Hampshire's economic opening and whether or not you would issue another stay-at-home order. And you also have 90 seconds. So here's the problem. Uh, Sununu is flying blind. Our testing capability is not reliable. The idea that you would go for a COVID test and have to wait eight days to get a response means that no one can do contact tracing when you show positive. And who knows who you've been in touch with for those eight days. That's been the problem from the outset. Sununu has followed the Trump-Pence line about this being flu-like and is not focused on improving our testing capability. As a matter of fact, because of things I did at the Executive Council, it's become clear that the testing contracts were given to political insiders. That was at a time when hospitals were laying off hundreds of employees. We should have given those testing contracts to the hospitals and kept those employees intact. So 
to the extent you want to reopen or to the extent you see a rise in positive cases and need to close, that has to be tempered by the lack of data that you're seeing. We need to make data-driven di decisions on this in both directions. Right now, po positive COVID tests are climbing, and that's a concern. I'm worried that when we start to get to October and we hit flu season, we hit cold season, we're going to wind up having to close down again. Uh, Council, let me take another 30 seconds for you and, and press you a little bit harder on this. Uh, I'm trying to understand your sense of whether or not the economy in New Hampshire has opened the appropriate amount now, or perhaps because of this testing issue you mentioned, uh, we should not be opening the economy. Where do you think we are right now? So you have two choices. Either you have really good, solid testing that produces data on which you can rely, or you get people to mask up and socially distance themselves. And so by masking up and socially distancing, you can overcome some of the lack in, te lack in testing data, but that does constrain business some. It should be a little more constrained than it is because we don't have the mask order and because we lack test data. Okay. Uh, gentlemen, let's uh, talk now about uh, climate change and energy policy. Uh, both of you have set out a timetable for New Hampshire to get completely off of fossil fuels. Uh, Councillor Valinsky, I believe your deadline is a bit more aggressive. Uh, 2030, I believe. Senator Feltis, I think you're saying 2050. Um, but both of you set an end date for New Hampshire to be off of fossil fuels. Um, the average national price for a gallon of gas is now $2.17. It's likely to go lower. Uh, Americans are gravitating back to larger SUVs. Uh, electric cars continue to be an expensive uh, niche market. Um, when the roads in my neighborhood were recently rebuilt, many of my neighbors took the opportunity to put in natural gas hookups. The question is for both of you, uh, what practical steps would you take to make your respective timetables achievable uh, and how would you lead on climate issues more broadly? And Councillor Valinsky, we'll start with you this time. So I, I think both of us have set dates for being carbon neutral. That doesn't mean all carbon has gone away. Uh, carbon neutral is the goal, 2030 in my plan. Uh, what I would do is convert the Office of Strategic Initiatives to the Agency for Climate, Energy, and the Environment. And its first task, I do that within 30 days, its first task would be to create a specific plan to get us to carbon neutral by 2030. That's more than cars and trucks. That's energy conservation, particularly in public buildings and school buildings and getting solar on every building that's possible so that we have more distributed energy, number one, and more fossil fuel free energy. We do have distinct differences on use of fracked gas. Climate change is an existential threat. We need to deal with it heads up aggressively now. That's why I was so opposed to the fracked gas $400 million Liberty Utilities Granite Bridge pipeline. I think that would have been a huge mistake and our different positions really show our different judgment on the issue. We cannot deal with this in a slow incremental fashion. We've waited too long as it is we need to get going and take aggressive action on the climate. So, uh, Council, let me clarify here for 30 seconds with you. So you're not, I was under the impression you were talking about being off of fossil fuels. You're, you're not suggesting that by 2030, there'll be no gasoline engines or uh, uh, oil burning furnaces. Take no, 30 seconds, please. Carbon neutrality means that your carbon output is neutral. So some... Yes some things are offset by other things. That's, that's the goal because we need to lower the rate at which the environment is heating up and that's how you accomplish it. And PS, if you do that, you can create new green jobs and that's why I'm a supporter of the regional Green New Deal. Okay, I appreciate that clarification. Some of the reading I did before uh, this event, there's some confusion over whether or not we're talking about carbon neutrality or complete elimination of uh, fossil fuel. So I appreciate the, the clarification. Uh, Senator Feltis, uh, 
90 seconds for you as well. Thank you. Um, I don't think we can wait or afford to wait for a regional Green New Deal to come together. We need to take bold action right here in New Hampshire. That's why we put forward our own clean energy plan, green jobs, green future. You can take a look at it online, working with Dan Weeks and Gary Hirschberg, among others, to help craft that. And it builds off of the work that we did in the legislature as vice chair of the Energy Committee, leading on climate in the state Senate. We passed 14 pieces of legislation that Chris Sununu vetoed on clean energy, everywhere from net metering to energy efficiency to distributed generation to new solar. And when he vetoed my new solar bill to ramp up solar in the state by eight times, Dean, he actually in his veto statement said this amounted to crony capitalism for the solar industry. Literally said that in a veto statement. So on the Senate floor on veto override day, I said, I respectfully disagree with the use of that kind of language and veto statement, but since you did, let's talk about it. Chris Sununu's brother is a lobbyist for the fossil fuel industry and his family is closely associated with an Orwellian named group called New England Ratepayers Association. And so if, if anything fell within the definition of crony capitalism, that veto of that solar bill did. And we're falling behind in jobs. Lost 20% of solar jobs under Chris Sununu. Our rates are going up because of Chris Sununu's vetoes. And so this is not just about combating the climate crisis. It's about reducing rates. And it's about advancing jobs, good jobs, for people who lost their jobs in COVID-19. Uh, uh, Senator Felt, just take another 30 seconds and uh, tell us a bit more about your position on the future of natural gas just you've been criticized for that and we want clarity on where you stand. Sure, well, uh, basically, I don't think that we should cut off people's heat. Uh, it's pretty basic. And denying there's a winter heating need in New Hampshire is akin to denying climate change. And so as a legal aid lawyer, I used to represent folks who in some cases got their heat cut off, Dean, and they were heating, those families were heating their, their apartments and their homes with their electric ovens open. I saw that. It gets cold in the wintertime in New Hampshire and 80% of Granite Cedars heat their homes with oil or natural gas. And we need to provide them a meaningful opportunity to transition. Uh, I, I'd like to respond to that if I might. Oh, okay, take, take just 30 seconds and then we need to move on. Go I'll, ahead, uh, Councilor. I'll, I'll be quick. My only point is it's the utilities talking point that the only way to solve the way the problem of getting heat for poor people, for working class people, is to commit to 20 years of fracked gas. That's a false dichotomy. There are other things we can do. We can directly subsidize people to get off of fracked gas when they can't afford to do it otherwise. You don't have to build a $400 million fracked gas pipeline to do that. Yeah, I'm aware that there will continue to be some disagreement between uh, you two gentlemen, and unfortunately, given time, we need, we could do the whole debate on climate and energy, but I want to move on a little bit. Uh, sure. Let's let's talk now about uh, tax policy uh, and the pledge. Uh, you've each staked out a somewhat different uh, uh, different position on the implementation of broad-based sales and income taxes in the state. Um, a refusal to take the pledge uh, has been an electoral loser in the past for Democrats. Uh, please, each of you tell us your position on the pledge and why you think your position makes the most sense as governor, especially within the context of uh, property tax relief. And this time we'll start with Senator Feltis. Thank you very much, Dean. I don't support a broad-based income or sales tax. I support doing what we did in the last budget, which is closing loopholes for those at the top and big corporations, including multi-state, multinational corporations, to secure the biggest public school education budget in state history. 140 million in new education funding for our communities, helping Nashville and Manchester communities all across the state. Finally doing full day kindergarten, something I ran on for the first time in 2014. We treat kindergartens the same as any other grade schooler. Used to be they got 50% of the support of other grade schoolers, a rationale that they were not as tall as other grade schoolers. I'm just kidding, that wasn't the rationale. Um, we just didn't want to fund it. But I believe the investments we make in our kids are the best investments we can make. They're Iris and Josie's future, they're a collective future, and they deserve a foundation for success and opportunity that's as strong as the granite under our soil. So for decades though, politicians have been telling you it's either a broad-based income tax or nothing. And I can tell you that's not true. We just showed it. And we'll continue to show it. We've got to protect this progressive budget. And I'm honored to be supported by the chair of the Senate Education Committee the chair of the House Education Committee, the chair of the School Funding Committee, American Federation of Teachers, 
Uh, these folks who worked in the process support this campaign because we don't just debate, we deliver real results for our schools. Say again. Uh, you're, Roger, I think Dean is muted. I could hear. There we Dave. go. Thank you. Yeah. My, my apologies. Yeah. I, I muted myself to cough, and uh, because of the way we have this structured, I can't. I can't unmute myself without permission. I am now officially unmuted. And counselor, you have the floor for ninety seconds. Look, I've been working on school funding for almost thirty years. I think it's fair to say that there's not another person who's run for governor who knows more about how this works. My friends John Tobin, Doug Hall, and I conducted almost 70 forums around the state explaining exactly how school funding works. And if you had attended one of those forums, you would know that the most progressive budget that Dan talks about kept us 50th in the nation in state support for public education, worst in the nation for state support. That means we are most reliant on the local property tax. And here's a point where I push back against Dean a little bit the most broad-based tax in New Hampshire is the property tax. If you live in New Hampshire, you pay it. You pay it directly as a homeowner, indirectly as a renter. If you're a business, you pay twice as much in the property tax as you pay in a business tax. It is the problem. And there are other alternatives to sales tax, to income tax, we need to have an adult discussion with, as Jean Shaheen said, when she refused to take the pledge in her third term with all options on the table, because what we're doing now is not sustainable. Uh, Senator Feltis, yes, I'm gonna give you 30 seconds to respond to that. Thank you very much. Well, I think the Democrats in the legislature had an adult conversation and delivered historic education funding for our communities. And if we want to talk about where the state is and state support for local communities, that's a bit of a head scratcher. Just about a week and a half ago, my friend, Councillor Valinsky said, and I quote, I think the overall amount we spend on schools is about right. I disagree. We need to spend more on schools as a state. We need to make sure that we build off of that progressive budget. And that's exactly what I'll do. I think yes, I guess. Go, ahead, go, ahead, go ahead, Counselor, take 30 seconds and respond and then we're gonna, then we're gonna move on. Yeah, it's unhelpful to the debate to draw quotes out of context. New Hampshire spends $3.2 billion on public education. That overall spending is about right. The problem is some districts spend ten dollars and $15,000 per pupil more than other districts. So if we made the spending fair, if we made the way we raise the money fair, then we are about right. The problem is we have the most unfair way of doing it that you could possibly imagine. I don't support that. Dan wants to close loopholes that won't address the structural problem. Yeah, we've got about 10 minutes left for questions before we go to closing statements. I want to try to fit in a few more questions. Um, let's, let's talk a bit about mental health and opioid addiction. Uh, there are certainly connections there. And in addition, the pandemic has made mental health and addiction issues more pressing than ever. Uh, the governor recently revamped the treatment of addiction with his hub model. Uh, I'm interested to hear from both of you how you think that's working and what you would do differently. And we'll start with Councillor Walensky. Yeah, I was on the council with Sununu when he told us that he dreamed up the hub and spoke model. Uh, I knew that that model had been in existence for five years at that point in Vermont. So I went there to ask them, how's it working? And it turns out the hubs are relatively easy to stand up because they're usually built around hospitals. The problem are the spokes, the providers in the community. And often we don't have enough providers, particularly in the more rural communities. And in part, that's a problem because New Hampshire is lowest in the nation for reimbursing mental health providers in our communities. So Medicaid needs to reimburse at a higher level. The 3% increase in the recent budget was not a bad start, but it's not enough to make a difference. We need to have fair reimbursement 
for Medicaid providers who work in communities. New Hampshire used to have a nation leading community mental health system under Don Shumway. He built it. We need that kind of approach, rebuilding the system, investing in the system so that communities like Manchester and Nashua with safe station programs aren't asked to take the brunt of the cost of opioid treatment the way has been happening in the last two or three years. Senator? Thank you. Well, we have to build this out across the continuum of care, Dean, and it's being exacerbated by COVID-19. And uh, there's a few things here. Number one, um, we did Senate Bill 14, a bill I sponsored. We put in the budget a comprehensive children's system of care, including a statewide mobile crisis intervention and stabilization team to reach any child in distress within the state within an hour and to give them timely, appropriate, and community-based care. That was in the budget. That was funded. It's yet to even gone out to an RFP by Sununu. And now we have 20 kids as of Thursday this past week, Dean, 20 kids who are sitting in emergency rooms waiting for needed, necessary, and, and uh, appropriate mental health care. That's completely unfair. We got to move forward on uh, treatment, uh, including opioid misuse treatment. And you know, I got to tell you, we're second worst in the nation on uh, treatment capacity and second worst opioid epidemic, even prior to COVID-19. And Chris Sununu's so-called doorways model, despite the best efforts of people on the ground, was largely a doorway to nowhere. No treatment capacity on the back end. And he vetoed Senator Rosenwald's bill uh, that I worked on with her and an honor to have her support in this race, Senate Bill 5, to, to support addiction treatment services. We got a 24-0 vote out of the state Senate team. 24-0 vote. He vetoed it anyways. And then uh, my Republican colleague stood behind him because he asked them to, because he said, your vote on veto overrides, it's not about the issues or your constituents. It's about me and protecting my veto. Literally, if that's the antithesis of public service. That's a Trumpian way to govern. And it's no wonder he calls himself a Trump guy through and through. Mm -hmm. uh, let's, we're, we're getting short on time, but let's talk about school funding for a moment. Um, there's been a debate over the expansion of charter schools in New Hampshire. Uh, there's been debate over the disbursement of federal emergency funds coming out of the pandemic. Uh, we hear a lot of talk about the high cost of uh, the university system and student debt coming out of college. Uh, let me ask each of you for your thoughts on the most pressing issues for education funding in New Hampshire. And this time we'll start with Senator Feltis. Well, we need to take a cradle to career approach to education and career readiness. Uh, we need to end the reality that New Hampshire is one of only six states that does nothing in state support for pre-K. Uh, because I happen to believe, as I said, the best investments we can make as a society and the investments we make in our kids. We need to use uh, the uh, leverage in the state budget to not just freeze tuition, but lower it at the, at the uh, state level, state colleges and university. Uh, we froze in the last budget, we need to lower it. Uh, but we need to go beyond that and recognize what working families are faced right now. And including the absence of a school reopening program and plan in support. Maine did 165 million to their schools to support them in reopening. Uh, New Hampshire has done zero additional support. And in fact, Sununu gave 1.5 million to private schools uh, while our public schools are struggling. I'm of that fundamental belief we are all in this together. Sununu said our schools are on their own and that crushes working families. Working families with so much uncertainty about what's going on. And by the way, local business leaders are not too happy either because they have employees that have kids in school. And the lack of certainty, the lack of structure, and the lack of support is affecting all of us. It's affecting our economy, and it affects how we move forward together. So all of this is intertwined into that larger debate and discussion about how we get out of this COVID mess in a way that looks out for working people and working families. And if I have the honor and privilege of serving as the next governor, that's what I'll look out for each and every step of the way. Councilor Walensky, 90 seconds. So COVID-19 has made our school funding problems more acute. Remote learning works well in certain circumstances if you have the right equipment, if you have access to broadband, if you have supervision of parents who have the time to spend it with you. Not everyone's in that situation and children are being lost and falling behind over and over again in some of the less well-resourced communities in our state. So COVID's made things worse. We need to fund pre-kindergarten, particularly focused on areas 
with the highest need is how I'd start there. School funding needs to be done in a fair way. We need to reduce the over-reliance, worst in the nation reliance on the property tax. We need to make community college free to start with for careers that we want to start incentivizing. I'm thinking of nurses, I'm thinking of early childhood educators, I'm thinking of mental health workers, I'm thinking of some of our first responders. We start there and then we work to make community college free for every New Hampshire resident. You know, if you go to community college in New Hampshire, it costs you $7,600 a year. If you go in Maine, it's $2,800 a year. That's a disadvantage that we cannot bear and stay competitive. At the university level, we need to be thinking about the same thing. New Hampshire has the worst in the nation debt level for students, and we need to deal with it. We have time for one more question before we go to closing statements. Uh, let's talk about family medical leave. Uh, it's been a very important part of the Democratic agenda in the state legislature, uh, but it has now faced multiple high-profile vetoes by Governor Sununu. Uh, there was a time three or four years ago when I thought this might be an area of agreement between the two parties, uh, but that hasn't turned out to be the case. Uh, Republicans have labeled the Democratic funding mechanism uh, an income tax. And my question to both of you, starting with Councillor Volinsky, is why is that argument wrong? I, I don't care whether it's right or wrong. We need to pass paid family leave now, particularly in the midst of a COVID pandemic. The governor has acted in a childish fashion in ways that Dan's already described. That conduct is unbecoming of a governor. We can have policy differences and make our policy decisions. But here's the problem. If you fall for the Republican argument that all methods of raising revenue are bad and that we need to avoid them because it's not the New Hampshire way, then you can't do the kinds of programs that need to happen. Paid family leave needs to happen. It's not a vacation, as Sununu says. Young families having children deserve a break. Older families taking care of their senior relatives need a break. You get COVID, you need the break. We ought to pass it, put it on my desk, I'll sign it right away. Senator? Well, Dean, can you repeat the question? I forgot the last Yeah, that is the family medical leave. Basically, you know, three, four years ago, it seemed like there might be some conceptual yep. agreement. Now we have the income tax argument. My question was, why is that wrong or why should we reject that argument? Well, I'll start with that. Or does it matter? As, as the counselor says, does it even matter? Well, I think it does matter. You know, and having written, having wrote the bill, I'll tell you why it's wrong. Um, there's not even a required tax in the bill. The requirement is that workers have access to paid family and medical leave. And there are plenty of options in the bill about how businesses potentially do that. One potential option is similar to unemployment insurance. And so they're not even a required tax in the bill, um, uh, Dean. It's just a requirement that workers have access. Here's what's going on here. Um, Chris Sununu opposes paid family and medical leave. He does. So this is what he's inventing as a reason to uh, uh, justify his opposition. There were those who said the same thing about Medicaid expansion, that it was, a, uh, in their view, an income tax. So it seems as though when you oppose something, you call it something like that. Um, that's what's going on here, plain and simple. And even a conservative reporter, Michael Graham, fact-checked it to determine that it's not what Chris Sununu says it is. And by the way, we've had bipartisan support. It's Chris Sununu who's on the outside on this. It was three or four years ago that myself and the late Representative Mary Stewart Guile worked on House Bill 628 through the system, passing a Republican House, making it to the Senate, and then Chris Sununu deciding the big insurance industry wanted it dead, so I'm going to write a letter to the Senate, and the Republican Senate killed it. Uh, and then the last two bills, Senate Bill 1, my bill, and House Bill 712, Mary Jane uh, Walner's bill in the House, had Republican co-sponsors and got Republican votes. So Chris Sununu is the obstacle to paid family leave in the state of New Hampshire. So um, I said at the beginning of the debate that I would be fair in my additional allocation of time. Senator Feltis, I owe you 30 seconds 
uh, let me follow up on family medical leave and get you to give us a sense of, of <clears throat> is there any possibility at all with divided government that we'll see uh, family leave going forward? Absolutely. I mean, like I said, this is bipartisan work that we've done. Um, focused on working families, focused on combating the opioid epidemic, the caregiving crisis, COVID-19. It's bipartisan work. The obstacle is Chris Sununu and his vetoes of bipartisan legislation, Dean. So once we win this race, once we stop Chris Sununu from, with a rare third term in office, we'll get that bill done that I filed. Okay, that brings us to the end of the question and answer period of the debate. Uh, we will now turn to three minute closing statements and by prior agreement, Councilor Walensky is gonna go first. Great, thank you everyone for holding this debate, inviting us here to speak with you. So Dan said something in his last answer that I think is important. The Republican way to challenge anything of value is to call it an income tax. We as Democrats need to break away from that approach and reject it across the board. There is more that unites Dan and I because we are Democrats than divides us, but the things that separate us are important. I won't take the pledge because we have to have an honest conversation. Calling our budget the most progressive in history is a talking point. It is not a structural change. We need to make structural change and calling me an income taxer, which is what happens over and over again, is the Republican tactic. We should avoid it. Climate change. Climate change is on the mind of everyone, even during the COVID pandemic. And if you want to make a contrast against Chris Sununu, who has not met a pipeline project he didn't love, you have to think of the contrast. Sununu supported Northern Pass. I was in the Supreme Court opposed to it. Sununu supported the fracked gas pipeline. I've opposed it from the start, said it was a, bet, a bad idea and that there are better ways to deal with protecting the environment and not doing it on the backs of working people. Moreover, we need to create jobs in a green new economy starting now for those people. So look, you do have differences between the Democratic candidates. We have a September 8th primary. We're endorsed by all of the key important climate and environmental groups, Sierra Club, 350.org, New Hampshire Climate Strike, Sunrise Movement. We're endorsed by the larger teacher union, 17,000 member NEA New Hampshire, after a fair and democratic process. We're endorsed by the SEIU, 8,500 members, again, after a democratic process. I am proud of those endorsements. Ben and Jerry have endorsed me and they've named a ice cream after me, Valinsky's Courageous Crunch, because of my positions on campaign finance. Granny Doris Haddock has also, her family's endorsed me because of our positions on campaign finance. The fact that I have never had to return money to contributors to be consistent with my own campaign commercials. That's never happened to our campaign. I ask you to look at our website, Valinsky NH, I humbly, humbly ask for your vote on September 8th. Do it by absentee. Be safe. Take care. Thank you so much. Thank you, Councillor Valinsky. Uh, Senator Feltis, your closing statement, please. Thank you very much, Dean and Roger and Katie <coughs> and, and Andrew. Um, look, just, just briefly, because uh, I want to just fact check this real quick. We never were forced to do anything. You know what? We've been leading by example uh, in campaign finance reform. No corporate money, no corporate PAC money, no LLC money. And we're endorsing this race by End Citizens United, leading the charge in the state Senate, sponsoring over 30 pieces of campaign finance reform legislation. And we're the only candidate to sign on to the People's Pledge in this race, getting dark money out of politics. And I'm the only candidate to release his or her tax returns in the race for governor. But more overarching, uh, what's going on here? setting aside all that stuff, what's at stake here is looking out for working people, working families. That's this race. It's a whose side are you on moment. And each and every step of the way, um, you know, growing up in a working class family, my dad worked in a furniture factory, my mom part-time jobs, including the night shift while raising four kids, 
fighting for workers and families who were crushed by job loss during the last economic crisis, the Great Recession. Some of the same families getting hammered right now in COVID-19. That's what this race is about to me. Those workers, those families having someone in their corner, in the corner office, they don't have that right now. Kristen Newton wants a rare third term and he's looking out for corporate special interests and those at the top. That's what this race is all about. So I'd ask you to join us. I respectfully ask for your vote. We have the clear contest. We have the broad coalition to support to win this thing. Over a hundred state reps, 10 state senators, Steve Marsh, and Molly Kelly, Colin Van Osteren, and Citizen United, Let America Vote, the Voter Protection Project, uh, 15 labor unions. We're working hard to, to bring in and unite people, lift people up, because uh, that's what this is gonna take. Uh, this isn't impossible. And nothing about the story of New Hampshire has been about what's impossible. It's been about what we can do together. And we can do this. I know we can. We can win this race if we work together and, and lift up the voices of people who are falling through the cracks right now. And talk about what a future looks like when we look out for one another. When we lift each other up, not tear each other down. When we fight to include more people in our democracy and economy, not exclude them. We will work for a relief and recovery effort that works for everybody, not just those at the top. So we need you. We need your ongoing activism though. And I'm reminded on that quote on activism from Bobby Kennedy and then apartheid South Africa, when he said, each time someone strikes out against injustice or acts to improve a lot of others, they send forth a tiny ripple of hope. And through many acts of kindness and activism, those ripples, they turn into waves, and those waves can shake down the greatest walls of intolerance and injustice that still exist. That quote, it was true then, it's true now. We need you. Everything you do and say counts, and I'm confident that working together, we're not just going to win this. We'll move New Hampshire forward for everybody. Thank you to uh, both of our candidates for a very engaging and informative uh, forum. Uh, thank you to Roger Lessard for his uh, exemplary timekeeping. Uh, it was tremendously helpful. Uh, this brings to a conclusion the, uh, the debate for this evening. Uh, thank you all for attending. Be thank safe. Everyone take care. Before we all go away, I just want to make sure to give credit to Katie Kutchell and the uh, Hillsborough County Democrats communications team. Absolutely. For this thing together. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Take care, everybody. Good night, folks. Take care.